Good day, everyone. I'm Lisa Adams, Director of the Center for Global Health Equity at the Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth, and currently have the privilege of serving as the co-chair of the Dartmouth COVID-19 Task Force. It's a real honor to be moderating today's program entitled, What's Needed to Reopen Safely? Now, before I introduce today's speaker, I just want to run through a couple of housekeeping items. First, please submit your questions through the Q&A button, not the chat button, but the Q&A button, and that's located at the bottom of your webinar window. If you see a question that interests you, you can actually click on the thumbs up button to vote that question up in the queue, and we'll do our best to get to as many questions as we can in this session. Please reserve the use of the chat box for any technical difficulties or challenges you might be experiencing. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available to all attendees after today's session. Also, you will be receiving a survey at the conclusion of today's program, and we ask that you please take a brief moment to provide your feedback to help us enhance any future programming. So now on to our program. It is my pleasure to introduce my medical school classmate and friend, Dr. Peter Kilmarks. He's an infectious disease specialist and a 21-year veteran of the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Peter is currently the Deputy Director of the Fogarty International Center at the National Institutes of Health. In 2014 and 2015, he was named a health hero by the CDC for his work in the fight against Ebola. He's also served as CDC's country director in Zimbabwe, managing implementation of the U.S. efforts to reduce HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. Welcome, Peter, and I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you, Lisa, and good evening, everyone. It's such an honor. It's such a pleasure to have this opportunity. I owe so much to Dartmouth and to Geisel, and especially appreciate being having as the moderator my classmate and friend, Lisa Adams. So my slides will advance, which I know they will. So I've been asked to cover a lot of ground uh, in 20 minutes. So I'm gonna, uh, we're gonna march through these uh, topics in the next 20 minutes. I've got about 20 slides in 20 minutes and we're gonna have plenty of time left over to delve more deeply into any issues that you have some questions about. So first, a little COVID-101. The virus, the syndrome emerged in Wuhan, China in late 2019. There's some discussion about exactly when and exactly how, which we could get into. Um, I need to minimize my picture so I can see the rest of the slide and everyone can do the same. So the virus SARS-CoV-2 is an enveloped, positive sense, single-stranded RNA virus. And you can see in the phylogenetic tree on the right that the alpha and beta coronaviruses are uh, the human coronaviruses. There's four that are part of the, that are, uh, cause the common cold. And then uh, three SARS, uh, now SARS-CoV-1, MERS and now SARS-CoV-2 beta coronaviruses that cause more severe disease. So it's most closely related to a bat coronavirus and that's the origin. There are some questions about whether there was and what, uh, what the intermediate host may have been. The spread is primarily in uh, close contact by respiratory droplets, also some through fomites or inanimate objects and there's increasing appreciation about presymptomatic and asymptomatic spread of the virus. Uh, clinically, it's a uh, fever, chills, cough, shortness of breath, myalgia, headache, anosmia, or loss of sense of smell and other symptoms, where there's increasing appreciation that there's asymptomatic infection, although that hasn't been well-defined, the extent of that. But among the symptomatic, it's mostly mild cases, about 15% severe and 5% critical requiring critical care and ventilation. And the case fatality rate is somewhere in the 0.5% to 2% range, so about tenfold more than the seasonal flu. There's also increasing appreciation for the much greater risk of severe disease and mortality in elderly uh, patients, also with underlying conditions and in racial and ethnic minorities. Just a snapshot of the epidemiology, there's now over 1.7 million cases in the United States, over 100,000 deaths uh, to date. So really uh, devastating in that regard. 
there's now declines in some heavily affected states, but also increases in some other states. Uh, looking on the, on the right, we can see that there's this plateau that's uh, in the numbers of cases per day that's been decreasing. It's been concerning to hear people say, well, we've now plateaued, so that's a good thing, but not appreciating that this plateau is with a very high number of cases per day, although it is now coming down. And similarly, the number of deaths per day, it wasn't an inverted V where it peaked and then dropped quickly as in some other countries, uh, but is, is coming down and is now coming down uh, even more quickly in recent days. There's been out, also an increasing appreciation of the outbreaks related in, in special populations, meatpacking plants, nursing homes, and correctional facilities. So with a new virus pandemic, there's a heavy emphasis on research. We really do need new tools to be able to address this. There's major US investment in these countermeasures. Just for NIH, the appropriation from Congress to date has been $3.6 billion. And I'll just touch on a few of the major initiatives. From the White House week before last, there was an announcement about Operation Warp Speed. This is a public-private partnership for development, manufacture, and distribution of countermeasures that includes the Department of Health and Human Services, defense, um, private firms, and other federal agencies as an ambitious goal of having substantial quantities of safe, effective vaccine available for Americans by January of 2021. For the NIH, uh, two main initiatives I'll mention. One is active, accelerating COVID-19 therapeutic interventions in vaccines. This is a collaboration with NIH, the Foundation for NIH, pharmaceutical companies, other uh, HHS uh, agencies, and the European Medicines Agency. This is to have a framework focused on vaccine and drug candidates. And then the, uh, for diagnostics, the initiative is called RADx, and this is to speed research and development on testing technologies with another ambitious goal to make millions of accurate, easy to use tests, uh, point of care tests available per week by late summer or fall of this year. And this is being done through a, a kind of a shark tank process to identify the best candidates. For vaccines, there's over 110 vaccines now in development and nine that are in human clinical trials. So this is really a remarkable uh, volume of activity, uh, numbers of, of products being developed. This schematic shows some of the, the vaccine strategies. I'll just touch on one in, in a little detail. There's Moderna mRNA vaccine. This was developed by the NIH Vaccine Research Center. And the, time, the timeline is remarkable that the, the RNA sequence of SARS-CoV-2 was published by the Chinese on January 10th. And the first human dose of the vaccine was on March 16th just 65 days later. So this is by far the fastest uh, time period development from identifying a pathogen to having a human vaccine. And the way this works, I'll show with my pointer. So the vaccine is mRNA. It gets into the human cells. And then the human cells actually develop, uh, make the spike protein, make the antigen that the, that the body then develops the, the immune reaction to and the antibodies to. So this was reported to be safe and immunogenic um, just recently, and the phase three study is anticipated in July. And then for treatments, uh, over 300 under development, again, a, a remarkable volume of work, a uh, number of, of uh, treatments being evaluated. From the NIH, one of the, the main approaches is through an adaptive COVID-19 treatment trial and the first drug studied was Remdesivir, which is uh, uh, sponsored by Gilead. I see a typo there, that's Gilead. Um, this uh, recently reported showed a faster recovery in patients with advanced disease, uh, 11 days uh, in those that were uh, receiving the Remdesivir versus 15 days in, in those who were getting the placebo. This was statistically significant. For mortality, there was, it was about 7% at 14 days in those receiving the remdesivir and nearly 12% in those on placebo. This was not statistically significant. Uh, and this is not considered to be the home run or the, the, you know, the cure that we need. This is available under an FDA emergency use authorization, 
but uh, still uh, more better treatments are needed. There's a new study going on with remdesivir and uh, together with an anti-inflammatory virucitinib, which is to, the, to address the overwhelming immune response. It's part of the pathophysiology of COVID-19. In diagnostics, this infographic on the right uh, shows uh, the, the main information about molecular tests, uh, especially the RT-PCR, the uh, 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 RT-PCR test. Um, that's from uh, typically a, a nasal or throat swab and amplifies the nucleic acid, which is then detected. That's quite specific. If, that, if that's positive, that's a positive. There are issues with sensitivity. Then the middle column is the uh, antibody test, the serological test. This is uh, fairly uh, sensitive. So almost everybody within two weeks of infection does develop an immune response in antibody and then the, in, in their blood. And then the third column, the antigen test, um, this is also to detect, act, to diagnose active infection and uh, somewhat less sensitive than the, uh, than the PCR testing. So just wanna make a couple of comments about the diagnostic tests and sensitivity. So this RT-PCR is really only about 70% sensitive when it's taken together with uh, bronchoavelar lavage and other specimens and then these, these other tests, um, the isothermal NAT test or the antigen testing, these have lower sensitivity even compared to the PCR. So sensitivity really is an issue with, uh, with the diagnostic testing. And then for the serologic testing, the issue is really around specificity or false positives. And just as an example, if you've got a test with 95% specificity, which sounds pretty good in a population with a 5% prevalence, which is the US prevalence multiplied by 10, um, half of your positive tests are gonna be false positive tests. So that's a big caveat in interpreting the results of those tests. And in addition, we don't really know, um, there's some indication um, from other coronaviruses, um, but we don't really know if uh, past infection is considered immunity or durable protection from reinfection. So for now, uh, the guidance is that seropositive, the serologic testing is especially helpful for uh, surveys, for population-based studies, um, but it's, we're not in a place where we can report to somebody if they're seropositive, if they're immune from infection. Now, uh, moving on to opening up America, the uh, White House last month uh, came up with uh, this announcement, these, this guidance and criteria for reopening. Um, this is the so-called gating criteria that there should be a downward trajectory in symptoms of uh, symptomatic uh, people and in, in cases and diagnosed cases. Also that hospitals need to be prepared and have the capacity to treat patients without crisis care and that there should be state uh, preparedness and, and uh, capacity for testing, contact tracing and other plans in place. Just in the phase one, of this uh, plan uh, once, and this is only once those gating criteria have been met, it, it underscores that uh, households that have vulnerable residents should take, uh, continue to take uh, precautions about getting infected or passing infection onto their residents, still avoid socializing in groups greater than 10, still minimizing non-essential travel, encouraging telework, and uh, having returning to work in phases and that schools could remain closed. So this guidance goes on to uh, phases two and, and phase three, but I'm just gonna skip to more recently, just last week, the CDC, the CDC came out with more detailed guidance for reopening. And this 62-page uh, document pulls together the initiatives and activities and tools um, from CDC around COVID-19, gives uh, guidance around general surveillance and healthcare, healthcare surveillance um, infection control, contact tracing, and testing, and does actually provide some specificity to that. In the White House document, the gating criteria weren't very clear, and now in the CDC document, there's more clarity around, for example, what's considered a 14-day decline in the numbers of cases. And then there's also, um, in this announcement with this link at the bottom, um, also guidance for summer camp schools and, and other organization in some detail. I'm obviously not gonna to get, to get into all the de details in the short presentation, but that information is there. 
So uh, this is guidance on when to reopen, but it's, it's really, we're really seeing that uh, businesses and especially customers, the, the, the public needs to be confident that they can go resume economic activity, resume social activity, and really needs to have a quite robust uh, public health program to be able to really lower the numbers of cases and give people that assurance, that confidence to resume activities. So one of the critical activities is around testing. There's been a lot of talk about testing and challenges with testing. There's been uh, many calls to ramp up testing to as many as 30 million tests per week in the US. And currently we're at about 2.8 million tests per week. So we would have quite a ways to go. You can see in this, this graph of uh, tests per day that that's been increasing um, but still not at that, uh, at that, what some have recommended as a very high rate of testing. So that's about 10% of the country per week getting tested. So really have a very robust uh, testing, both for surveillance, but also to recognize uh, cases, uh, chains of transmission, and to be able to interrupt chains of transmission. Another area as part of a robust response is contact tracing. This is really critical to stop those chains of transmission. It's rapidly and confidentially identifying the contacts of cases to test them, quarantine them. If they're uninfected, isolate them. If they're infected, and this ideally needs to be done, the cases need to be interviewed, the contacts notifi notified within 48 hours and should be at least half of the contacts getting notified. So this is a big job. There's been estimates that over 100,000 contact tracers would be needed nationwide to do this. And there are some enhancements that could be uh, uh, provided with digital tools. So as one example, Apple and Google have gotten together and developed a tool using Bluetooth technology. So people can retrospectively through Bluetooth uh, uh, smartphones pinging each other, identify who had been in proximity to a case. But this is being, this contact tracing is being done effectively in several countries, including it's not all Asian countries, some Western countries. And it's really, I think a key point here is these investments in this public health response are really important for us to be able to resume our social and economic activities and to you know, much greater return on investment for, uh, through, we can invest billions in these responses to have trillions in economic uh, benefit. So how are we doing? Um, this website, Test and Trace, uh, follows the testing uh, capacity and contact uh, tracing capacity of the states. And they found there's only, uh, uh, let me see, five states that meet their criteria that, that uh, bright blue, that are dark blue, to be fully prepared to test and trace. So only 10 states have fewer than 3% positive tests, which is their uh, criteria, their setting to have a robust testing program and only eight states have five uh, or more contact tracers per daily case, which is their criteria for having adequate contact tracing. So uh, most states are not uh, fully ready for this uh, resuming the economic and social activity for reopening. So one idea that I've been championing is to have a COVID-19 response core and started a couple of months ago seeing this, this really unprecedented dual economic and health crisis. We've got millions of people unemployed. We've got a massive response workforce that's needed. So I started in mid-March when the Peace Corps volunteers were being evacuated, came up with this idea of having a COVID-19 response corps. For example, the Peace Corps volunteers could be engaged uh, by FEMA, which typically hires tens of thousands of responders in the face of an emergency. This, I got a lot of support from this from uh, uh, people all over in, uh, in, in uh, you know, other fellow public health responders, state and local health department leaders. And in short time, um, Senator Van Hollen and Collins and 38 other members of Congress wrote a letter to FEMA, Peace Corps and AmeriCorps and really asking them, please evaluate actually having this COVID-19 response corps. There's been a lot of other support, a lot of other proposed legislation talks about this idea of having a, a, a workforce, giving people uh, jobs, but then also providing this response to the, to the pandemic. The um, CDC has actually uh, used this language and, and uh, support for a COVID 
uh, response core, but in, in their uh, implementation, it's really primarily through the states and not-for-profit organizations and not a federal response. So there's really ongoing challenges with the speed and scale and the coordination of this response. So uh, everyone always wants to know, and I, if you uh, join the seminar thinking you were to get, get the date and the uh, prediction of when we're gonna open, very hard to predict. Um, this is from Mike Osterholm in Minnesota, a very smart guy about pandemics and epidemiology. And he talks about these three scenarios that assuming 18 to 24 months to reach herd immunity or even with a vaccine could be that kind of a time frame to have it fully uh, developed and available to all Americans. So the first scenario is we've had this first wave and then we, we would have repeated waves um, in, in the future through 2021. The second scenario, we're having this first wave and then like what happened in with the 1918, 1919 flu pandemic, a much bigger wave in the fall or winter of 2020, and then more uh, smaller waves after that. So in either of those two scenarios, it would be devastating, overwhelming healthcare facilities again, would need to probably have the, the uh, economic and social uh, shutdown that we're having. And then the third scenario was the slow burn. So there would continue this kind of plateau that we're seeing with ongoing cases, but not with another big wave again. So these are all scenarios that we may see going forward. Just a couple other things to touch on, especially for this audience, we're Ivy League uh, graduates, we're healthcare personnel. We need to be the smartest people in the room. We need to stay informed. We need to, especially in what we're sharing, be wearing misinformation. The WHO Director General, Dr. Tedros, said we're not just fighting an epidemic, we're fighting an infodemic and fake news spreads faster and more easily than this virus and is just as dangerous. So we're seeing tens of thousands of inaccurate or misleading posts on Twitter per day. And we especially need to be the ones that are, are consuming and especially sharing correct information. And then lastly, just wanna to touch on mental health issues. This is really a marathon uh, this is really, this is hard um, and we should take it easy on ourselves and on our families, on our community. I talk about uh, not, not social distancing, but physical distancing and social cohesion. So take a break, take care of yourself, make time to unwind. My, my wife and I play Kadima in our driveway every day as a little uh, socially distance exercise and, and fresh air but really take time to connect with others, to talk about what's happening. And if things, if uh, you or someone you're in contact with is really stressed out to, uh, to seek help. So in summary, we have a novel coronavirus respiratory infection. It's relatively easily spread in high fatality rate, which is why uh, it's been so challenging. We are seeing a gradual decline in infections and fatalities in the US overall but with ongoing risk in some jurisdictions and some populations. There's a massive, appropriately massive research and development effort ongoing uh, concerning that the criteria for, reop for reopening is not met in many jurisdictions. Um, and we do have this challenge, but I, I say also an opportunity to have a response workforce to be able to address this. So be smart and take care and thanks for your attention. I look forward to the discussion. I'm just going to close with this quote from uh, Tony Fauci from a couple of months ago, it's still very relevant. You've got to be realistic. You've got to understand you don't make the timeline. The virus makes the timeline. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. That was an excellent overview and you've given us a lot to think about and, and discuss. Um, and we've received quite a few questions already. Uh, I'm gonna begin the Q&A session though with the question that we received actually in advance of, of um, the, the, uh, tonight's session. Um, and that question has to do with what's, what kind of re, uh, assurances should employers be providing to uh, patrons around their employees, specifically, would it be reasonable for employees returning to in-person jobs to expect 
assurance of some basic level of COVID testing, contact tracing, and public reporting of test results before going back to work. And then maybe on the other side of it, would, would it be reasonable for patrons of restaurants um, and other establishments uh, or other in-person commercial activities to expect the proprietors to post similar assurances? Has CDC provided guidance as to what elements should be included in, in any or such assurances? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, so in that, that uh, guidance that I have in the slides, and one can drill down and look into it, there's a, a lot of specific guidance about distancing, about masks, about cleaning. Uh, there's not uh, guidance around t testing uh, staff. So that's a, a lot of uh, individual businesses. There is a general uh, uh, statement about that it would be especially appropriate for um, healthcare facilities, for nursing homes, for these really high risk groups. Um, but there's not, it's not spelled out in, in any detail. And I would say, you know, not as a federal employee, but as <laughs> just as a general uh, citizen and public health professional, and uh, that yes, the, for businesses to get their staff to come back, and especially for them to get their customers back, it's clear they're going to have to provide these assurances. I, I, I just saw a report today that some businesses are having, even with the high unemployment rates, some businesses are having trouble hiring because of people's concern about coming back into these conditions. Yeah, understood. Well, thank you. Um, I'm seeing a few questions too about this concern about um, transmission or getting infected uh, by the virus from surfaces um, and, or materials. And I know the CDC recently tried to clarify some of their recommendations. It, it caused a little bit of confusion. I think they've had to do some, some further clarification um, about what they meant, but uh, some of our viewers wanna know specifically, um, how, you know, how long um, do surfaces that could include things that um, parents are receiving from their kids' schools, mails and packages that we receive, other surfaces um, in rented spaces that we might visit, how, how long do they, those remain um, a risk for us uh, to become infected? Yeah, um, so that, that it is a confusing area. I think what CDC wanted to emphasize is the primary risk is really through close contact um, through respiratory droplets. So it's, it's being in a, a place with poor ventilation for a prolonged period of time, 10, 15 minutes, an hour um, with someone who they may not be symptomatic, but the virus is coming from their uh, talking or, uh, or, or breathing. But there is, they're not saying that there's no risk from, from fomites or from objects. So if someone coughs into their hand, opens the doorknob, you come along a minute later and open the same doorknob and then brush your face, that's, that would cause transmission. So, and then there's been these laboratory studies where the virus, and it depends on the, the uh, amount of the virus, the temperature, the humidity, the nature of the surface itself, and how long it will last. But it, it can be hours. Um, so if you're going into a restroom, um, you'd want to be sure, you know, be careful of what you touch or that it's been uh, decontaminated, been cleaned. Um, it, it's, it's less so in uh, like your mail. Um, so I, you know, pick up my, when the mail's delivered, my postman's wearing a mask and gloves anyway. So I, I uh, when I get to it, pick it up and open it and, and read it. Um, when I grocery shop, uh, when I come home, I uh, put away the groceries and then I wash my hands. So you have, you, you, I guess, uh, read the CDC guidance um, and don't drive yourself crazy. Great. Um, right. And continue washing our hands. Absolutely. It, the, yes. the, the, uh, change in that or their clarification guidance does not um, obviate the need for that. Um, one more question perhaps about um, service, services and surfaces. Uh, and then we'll, there's some questions around vaccine development. Um, but one of our viewers is asking that about uh, takeout from restaurants, right? They've heard that it's safest if you order takeout, heat it in your microwave. Um, and uh, they're curious why there seems to be no concern about spread from food and, and takeout orders or outdoor seating or in a restaurant um, and restaurant seating. Uh, okay, well, it's, it's not a foodborne illness. Um, there hasn't been 
uh, to my knowledge, and I've been following pretty closely, documented transmission um, with food as the, as the vector. Um, so the, the, con the concern would be more uh, the, the wait staff and the other uh, customers in the restaurant as the source, source of the infection. So when we get takeout, if it's cold and we want it warm, we warm it up. But if it's meant to be eaten cold, we get it cold. And, and I, I guess this also gets to the issue about just confidence that you'd want to uh, hope that your uh, preparers are wearing masks or gloves or washing their hands and those kinds of things. But it, it would be very unusual. It, it, it hasn't been documented of having uh, someone get, actually getting it from the food itself. Great, thank you. Um, so let's switch now to talk a little bit about uh, some vaccine development. Uh, and um, some of our viewers are asking, what is the likelihood that A, a vaccine will provide the protection um, that we really need and uh, that the hope of a vaccine is, is fostering? And B, or secondly, uh, that when January 2021 is targeted as the vaccine ready date, that it will in fact be ready for distribution to 300 plus um, million Americans uh, who are eagerly awaiting it. Yeah, so um, there's, so I, you know, I always think about what's the last thing I heard Tony Fauci say. <laughs> if I say that, I'm gonna be safe. So this isn't like HIV um, or malaria or tuberculosis uh, where we've, it's been so challenging to develop a vaccine. The science um, seems manageable that we should be able to do it. Um, and especially with so many different candidates, so many different approaches, so much effort going into, into this, the, it, it just, what takes time is usually, and I have a, I'm not gonna go back to my slides, but there's a nice graphic showing usually it's phase one and you get the results and then there's phase two and you get the results and it takes, that's why it takes so long. And what's being done is, ba is basically overlapping. So you're ready, you've got all the sites ready. As soon as you, you're done or even before you're done with one phase, you're already ready to launch into the next phase. And the, the big risk or investment is we're gonna to have to ramp up. If it's one dose, then 300 million vials and, and uh, in syringes, but if you need two doses, then you need 600 million vials in syringes, and those are some of the kinds of things. But so the plan is to already have those uh, ramping up and available, hoping that the phase three study is positive and you can go right into distribution. I, I am happy that so the, the uh, co-chairs of this uh, Operation Warp Speed, one is a four-star army general, uh, a retired four-star army general, who does logistics. I mean, that, he's an operations guy. So that gives me some confidence that, this will, that there, will be, there will be attention to this. Um, oh, just another aspect is also in, in what often happens, like with Ebola vaccine earlier um, and with Zika, that she'll be, you know, if we get all ready and have all these sites for the vaccine, and then uh, because of good management or possibly some seasonal effect, the rate of infection drops way down again, it, it, that can also delay how long it takes to prove efficacy and to, uh, and to know that the vaccine you have is gonna be effective. Great, thank you. Maybe sometime in the future, we can look forward to a combined, much like the MMR vaccine, a combined COVID influenza vaccine. Maybe that's on several of our wish lists. Yeah, so just a comment on that. So there's also a lot of work on a universal flu vaccine we're not, so, and flu is, is very tricky um, in the antigenic uh, drift and shift. And this is why we, you know, every year we have to pick which of the uh, components of the vaccine. We're not anticipating that with, with coronavirus. That it is, there, there is mutation and it's nice to be able to track the infections is something we're, we're actually uh, quite busy with, but not so much that you would expect that you would need a new vaccine. Great. Um, a couple of our uh, viewers picked up on some on uh, the last point that you were making about the um, concerns around misinformation and and some fake news um, uh, being promulgated. And one viewer asked regarding the misinformation. Uh, you just read the uh, article. Computer scientists at Carnegie Mellon uh, have determined that nearly half of all Twitter accounts <laughs> are spreading messages about COVID nineteen. Uh, and are likely to be bots. Um, 
So one question is, how do, how do we combat this? That's what the main question is. What, what is, what is the best way for us as, as um, we all try to be the smartest people in the room and, and well-informed uh, and, and uh, pass on the, the right information and rely on science, how do we do that? Well, this is such a challenge and it's, you know, we've already recognized that uh, the, the anti-vaccine movement was already identified last year by WHO as one of the top 10 threats to, to health. And it's, it's really remarkable how the, the anti-vaccine people have jumped on to the COVID-19 um, misinformation bandwagon. And uh, some of it is just flooding the zone, just you know, amplifying, getting the right information out there, you know, giving the kind of message that I'm giving is to be careful, you know, look at the source of what you're reading, get good information, and especially what you share, to share good information. I, so I've got this, this group of about uh, 60 people with this COVID-19 response corps that I've started. I get all these, these people that are interested, and so I send an email every couple of days to them about this. And part of my process is I uh, search Twitter for contact tracing. And the amount of disinformation and garbage that's on there is really, you know, I have to go brush my teeth after I read, <laughs> read some of the things about, you know, contact tracing is a Nazi plot and Bill Gates is, wants to put a microchip, you know, the vaccine is a Gates microchip and crazy, crazy stuff. So we, we do, I think, it just flood the zone with the, the, the correct information. Great. Thank you. Um, a couple of viewers are uh, very intrigued by your idea about the, the um, COVID core. And two questions that I'll, com I'll uh, combine together is one viewer is asking, um, if it's estimated that 100,000 contact traces will be needed, how many, you know, how many are currently in place? Um, and then uh, similarly, what would it really take to make this COVID core contact tracing <clears throat> um, cadre a reality and other ways Dartmouth can, can help move these ideas forward. Yeah, great. So uh, this is part of the erosion of our public health capacity over the last uh, more than a decade. There, that we've lost about 50,000 jobs in uh, public health in this country over the last couple of decades. So we're, we're down to only about 2,000 of these uh, disease intervention specialists, people who do the contact tracing, especially for sexually transmitted diseases, but also for tuberculosis. So what that, that uh, graphic that I showed that the folks that are tracing this, there's only a handful of states that have been able to ramp up to the, to the kind of capacity that's needed. Uh, Massachusetts has been a leader um, working with partners in health and uh, very early on uh, said they're gonna hire a thousand people and get that going. Um, so it's, as I said, it's, one might have anticipated that it would have been a federal workforce, um, but what it's, what's happening, and it's maybe somewhat analogous to the situation with testing and with ventilators, that the responsibility is really being put on the state and local jurisdictions. And so some are doing really well, um, and others are, others are uh, lagging behind. There has been funding made available um, to, uh, to the states through the CDC. Um, but, but the actual implementation of that, I saw in Georgia the other day that because of their state budget being so limited, they're actually furloughing some of their health department staff who would be just the ones to be doing this kind of contact tracing. So I guess it's really a kind of an act local kind of a thing and to find out in your state, in your city, um, who is doing this and how can, how can we connect them together to really learn best practices um, and, and, and some, of the, some of the lessons learned. There's, a, there's some bright spots. Um, Johns Hopkins has a Coursera course for contact tracing, and there's over 200,000 people that have signed up to take it. Um, so it's, you know, it's really, it's fun for, uh, you know, young social people. It's, you can do it at home from your cell phone, and uh, you get assigned to call people. And it's really, there are these, these uh, apps and tools, but everyone's saying it's really a person to person. How are you doing? You know, what's your situation? What, what kind of other social support do you need? And how can we you know, make sure your loved ones or your contacts are, are safe? Yeah, no, that's a very good point. And, and I know as we're thinking about it, Dartmouth, how we would do contact tracing if and when we're 
able to invite students back to campus, I, I'm always saying that the, any technology is gonna be a contact tracer augmenter, that it's never gonna take the place of that in-person interview. Um, there, there's just too, much, too, much, too many ways in which the technology um, could fail us. So it'll never replace that. And I, I think you bring up a really good point too, is that it's not just about getting a list of where you've been and whom you've been in contact with, but it's really about reaching out and ensuring that there's uh, support that's offered as part of that, that process. Yeah, and if, if they're a case, if they're infected, they need to be isolated. And that's, that can be hard for people. And, and I'm hearing, you know, because I'm in touch with these people all over the country, in San Francisco, a lot of the cases are migrant workers and there's like eight people in one room and they're all sharing one phone. So, you know, the concept of an app for tracing isn't going to work, but you've got, you've got to provide and they're using hotel rooms and meals on wheels and, you know, helping people to isolate. They, they want to, no one wants to infect someone else. Right. Um, and that actually is a good segue to another question that has risen to the top, which is we know that, uh, this uh, uh, disease has disproportionately affected communities of color. And um, viewers are asking, what are the factors behind these wor worse outcomes seen among um, communities of color? Uh, and is it health factors only or a combination of that together with structural inequalities? Love to hear your response to that. Okay, I wanna hear your response to some of these things too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to, I'll let you go first, I'm happy to. I'll go first. It's thought to be really a, a multifactorial uh, that um, s some minority communities are much more likely um, to be in these kinds of, of uh, so-called essential roles and, and have the contacts that put them at risk for infection. Um, and then um, there may be other sort of socioeconomic conditions of crowding um, urban residents uh, not, not having a personal vehicle, uh, using public transport, th th those kinds of additional risks. And then the underlying conditions, um, hypertension, diabetes, uh, overweight, can be more prevalent in, in minority populations. But then there are um, just with so many health conditions, uh, it's considered a kind of legacy of racism and, and slavery and underlying stress and, and leading to some of these poor outcomes. So it, it's really like with so, so many other um, conditions, it, it, was, it was very predictable that the minority communities would be more heavily impacted and, and it's really been striking to see it. But Lisa, what do you think? What, what, yeah. what? No, I, I think a lot of what you said and with the previous example you gave helps highlight that. What I will add is that at Dartmouth, we're very interested in looking at how um, this pandemic is affecting our rural communities. Um, rural, rural individuals living in poverty face all kinds of different challenges. And what we are discovering too is that of course, it's a lot of the social determinants of health issues um, and access to care is of course a, um, a big concern. And when you think about even, you know, like you said, sharing a, a, a single cell phone for a number of individuals or whether you live in a place where there is cell phone access or Think about um, <clears throat> um, if you're trying to even do telehealth visits when you're just in a, a single wide trailer where there's you know, really no privacy, how, how do you um, even seek health care uh, in those uh, circumstances? So I think, yes, a lot of the, 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 what, we're, what we're seeing is, is revealed, a lot of the um, inequities that already existed in our, our health care system. Um, around um, access and, and um, you know, related to social determinants of health. And I really liked what Don Berwick called it, uh, the um, founder of the um, uh, Institute for Healthcare Improvement. Uh, he's, he said, maybe there's a moral determinants of health. Um, and we need to really think about how we are going to respond as a society and as a healthcare system. And who do we wanna be in this pandemic? And I think that was a nice way to put it. And um, we really do need to think about shoring up the services for our most vulnerable. Um, many legacies, as you mentioned, that, that put them at, at greatest, greater risk now. Um, and that's just being exposed in, in this situation. Um, yeah, I'm trying to imagine uh, isolating a family member in a single wide trailer. 
That's right. not going to happen. Yeah. And I'm also reminded of my undergraduate classmate, um, the Right Reverend Rob Hirschfeld, who's the Bishop of New Hampshire. He reminded us that the, the root of apocalypse is to uncover or reveal. And mm. a lot of things are being revealed in this crisis. Yeah, indeed. Um, all right, we have another, uh, uh, many other questions coming in. I'll try to get through as many as we can. Um, one question too that is, has risen to the top is a question about um, the Chinese tested the entire population of the city of Wuhan um, over a 10 day period. Do you know what the test that was used, if it was reliable, and is it one of the ones that, that we're using? I, I don't know specifically what test they use. I, I assume it was the RT-PCR diagnostic mm -hmm. test um, that they would have been doing, uh, but I don't know the, the specifics of, of which exact test it was. It, it, but the, you know, in general, those are quite reliable, um, especially very um, uh, specific. If it's positive, it's a, uh, it's a positive. And, and to me, it's just remarkable Obviously, there's a lot of issues with China and Chinese society that we might not want to emulate. But to have that kind of response, um, to be able to test the entire, you know, almost the entire population of a city, nine million people in a week, um, and, and the response they had with back in in, in the initial outbreak, with they they if they had uh, fifth, I think it's fifteen hundred teams of epidemiologists with five people each. So they had like 9,000 contact tracers in Wuhan, which if, you, if, if uh, I call this going full Wuhan, if you, if you uh, uh, looked, looked at that, extrapolated that to the US, that would be 300,000 contact tracers. So some, some, you know, some aspects we uh, may not want to emulate, but there's some examples of having that kind of a, a robust response that's really impressive. Yeah. Agreed. I think many of us, when we saw what was happening in Wuhan and shutting down the city, trying to quarantine such a large city, we thought we, we'd never be able to do something like that. And to some extent, you know, we have, we've done our own version of it perhaps, but, but I think even what we're doing now, many of us couldn't have imagined just as, as short as two or two months ago. Um, well, our, our own version of that is why we have a plateau and not a, an inverted B. <laughs> if we really, you know, lock down uh, we, w we would have seen a much greater decline in cases. Yeah, for sure. Um, just a couple other sort of um, uh, specific questions here in terms of, we refer to it as a respiratory infection, respiratory disease, but um, some questions about uh, asking about the fact that it attacks other organs, the kidneys, blood vessels, et cetera. Um, I, I don't know if you have uh, any any comments about about that and how this is uh, really more of a multi-system um, disease than than more specifically a, a respiratory um, infection. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, I think it's from George. Uh, so it's 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 uh, the transmission is respiratory. The primary manifestation is respiratory, but it's it's the it's the ACE2 inhibitor, which is on multiple. Organ, so there's there's absolutely um, cardiac, renal, uh, other other manifestations, and also in the blood vessels. So that we're learning more. Um, there's a lot of, of coagulation, hypercoagulability, um, blood clots. Um, that uh, anticoagulation is is now part of the uh, the treatment for severely ill cases, um, and that's there's there's the ACE2 inhibitor in the in the endothelium. So that's that's an excellent point. And then we're also seeing, especially in the pediatric population, um, this this uh, multi-system um, inflammatory syndrome, uh, which is which is kind of like Kawasaki disease, uh, is another manifestation. But I was really struck. There was a, a study last month, a, an autopsy series, um, and I, I, I can't remember the exact numbers. But about half of the patients, uh, the, the cases in this autopsy series had blood clots and a quarter of them of, of, of massive pulmonary embolus was considered the cause of death. Wow. Um, all right, I think we have time for just maybe two more questions. Um, so uh, one that I think uh, um, you may have some thoughts on is uh, viewers are asking, given what we've seen, does it make sense to have the um, 
COVID-19 response is really led by states ra rather than the federal government. And maybe you could talk a little bit about where there is some of that uh, federal state divide and. Yeah, um, well, uh, it's, a, it's an excellent question. And I, I guess I would have anticipated more of a, a, a more of a hands-on federal response. Um, we saw with the testing, with the ventilators, um, and now with, with the workforce, um, there's, there's always going to be a state level uh, uh, leadership at the state level. So in talking about like the COVID-19 response corps, there was some reaction that, you know, this isn't federalizing the response. This would be, this would be federalizing the workforce. But then if, if, a, if a COVID responder goes to a, a state, they would be under the leadership, uh, you know, under the technical leadership and guidance of that state. Um, so, you know, I'm sure there'll be reports written uh, about uh, what went right and what went wrong in, uh, in our response, and that will definitely be one of the questions about, you know, how do we get this right? It's remarkable that the U.S. was considered to be the most prepared country for an outbreak like this, but, uh, you know, m much is being revealed about what the weaknesses are and what the challenges are. Yeah, indeed, and, and certainly we hope that there will be a much revealed and uh, a much learned from um, this, because uh, this certainly won't be the last uh, pandemic uh, that, that uh, the human race will see, so we'll, we do want to learn from it. I'm going to finish off with just one question. I'm going to let you answer it, and I have a feeling you may actually turn it back to me for comment as well. But it really has risen to the top with a lot of votes. Uh, based on what you know today, would you allow your college-age son to return to campus in the fall? Um, I would wait for the fall. Uh, it's, and as I showed in that slide with these different scenarios, um, nobody knows nothing. You have to wait until the time comes. And if my child were going to a, a small college in the Upper Valley and there had been no cases um, for weeks and this incredible Lisa Adams-led COVID response corps in, uh, in the Upper Valley and, and I was confident that cases would be detected and contacts traced and it would be under control, then I would be much more confident about it. But at this point, um, those, are, you know, those are the right kind of criteria that are in the guidance that would need to be, need to be uh, conditions that need to be put in place. Yeah. I, I think you raise a good point about how we, we actually are uh, struggle with the tension of waiting as long as possible because this is such a quickly evolving situation and trying to make a decision in a timely fashion so that people can plan accordingly, um, including, you know, if, if we are going to be welcoming some number of students back on campus, uh, you know, facilities, operations, there's a lot of preparation that, that needs to happen. Um, in addition to, of course, letting uh, students and their families know to be able to, to prepare accordingly. Uh, so I think um, some of you that are listening in may know that the provost has agreed to, uh, committed to making a decision about what our fall uh, term will look like by June 29th. And uh, we have, the task force is working with uh, several working groups, a uh, health epi one, a business continuity one, an academic continuity one, a housing one. Um, involving the graduate professional schools as well as the, the arts and sciences to really try to bring together all the best information that we have um, and put that together into a 35 page uh, report, which we have uh, just are in the process of sharing with the provost and senior leadership uh, to be able to, to make the most informed decision. But we all know, as you pointed out with the, the um, the, the future being uncertain, that things could change, um, hopefully for the better, but we have to be prepared for um, th them changing also so that, that whatever decisions are made, things could, could result in us having to uh, pull back from, from some of those decisions. Hopefully, uh, things will continue to uh, progress smoothly, and I am pleased to say that there seems to be um, New Hampshire's health department, led by some um, my infectious disease colleagues uh, is doing an astounding job and, and really great and great about communicating it. So if you do want to know about the New Hampshire data, please visit the, Dartmouth, the Department of Health and Human Services website for New Hampshire.
So Peter, I want to give you a few minutes now to um, make any uh, closing remarks, any final thoughts that you want to share with us before we end this session. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, no, it's been uh, really a, a pleasure to be able to participate and to talk to this group. It's, it's always very helpful for me. Um, I was asked for my slides a week ago, and I think I literally laughed out loud <laughs> and said whatever I prepare last week is going to be totally different by next week. Uh, just the epidemiology, the, you know, the new vaccine announcement, um, so the things just change day by day. So I, I'm really happy to have this opportunity to update myself, but also to share it. I think this is a really important group of the, the Dartmouth community and the medical school community. So I, I really you know, want to encourage all of you to stay informed, to be the, the source of wisdom, the, the voice crying in the wilderness about uh, being, having the right answers, having the appropriate response, and, and being leaders in your community. So thanks to all of you. Thanks to Lisa for, for hosting me. Yeah. Well, well, thank you. Thank you for being so generous with your time and, and sharing your thoughts and, and insights. And um, I completely understood when you said you're, you would send us your slides you know, the, the hour before that that was because you were gonna make sure that we had the most up-to-date information um, available. So we um, appreciate your, your taking the time um, to, to uh, share your insights and, and knowledge with us today. And I want to thank all of um, our viewers, all the attendees for joining us today. Um, I'm sorry that we weren't able to get to everyone's questions. There's still some questions I know in the queue. I tried to, to uh, make sure that those that rose to the top were, were, um, were answered. Uh, we do encourage you to visit the Dartmouth website for our most recent updates on what we're doing at the institution to uh, respond to COVID-19 and, and keep uh, our, our community, our faculty, staff, stu students, and, any, and the Upper Valley community as safe as possible. Um, and then the last thing I will mention before we close out is just a uh, reminder to please complete the two-minute survey that you will be receiving at the conclusion of this program. Uh, we really do rely on your feedback. Uh, it's used to enhance our future programming. And with that, I'd like to wish everyone a render wonderful rest of your day or evening. And everyone, stay healthy, stay safe, um, and wash your hands. Thank you. Bye-bye.